Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, everybody. Um, can you just let me know if you could hear me? Just trying to test out the microphone before we begin. We've got a few more minutes to go. I just want to make sure that my microphone is working. So if you could let me know, you can hear me. We greatly appreciate that. Oh, thank you, Juan. Pre thank you. Appreciate it. Let me see. Take a look at the questions. I see here, is it possible to import libraries from SolidWorks PCB to Eagle Fusion 360? You know, the team is uh, diligently working on um, expanding the capabilities for importation for um, Eagle as well as Fusion 360 uh, electronic designs. But at this moment, I, we don't have anything to offer. What we do have, if you visit library.io um, and use the same credentials you use for logging on to Fusion 360 or, or Eagle, uh, there's a converter there for libraries, but this is primarily for Altium and um, Orcad libraries to convert those. That's what we have so far. It's an online sol uh, converter. So you could use that, but but for SolidWorks or any other applications at this time, we, we don't have any other libraries available or converters available. I hope this helps out. You know, Fox, my son, um, he's working on his master's for, in biomed here at FIU, um, Florida International University. And, um, and he became part of a team that are 3D printing a face mask as well, uh, face plates, uh, face protectors for um, our hospital in Miami, Baptist uh, Hospital in Miami. And um, I have a, a printer and he has one. So they've been going on strong all the time. If everything goes okay, tomorrow morning we'll be doing a delivery again to them. So uh congratulations and thank you for participating and if anybody here has um, a relationship with somebody that is part of the first responders uh, on behalf of autodesk and myself please give them uh, a big thanks in our behalf once this is all done and over then we could all give them a really tight hug <laughs> but in the meantime we can um say thank you for those uh, putting their lives at risk for the good of our uh, fellows. Where's everybody from? I would love to know where's everybody located. Oh, Spain. Okay. Uh, La Madre Patria, España. UK in the house. Excellent.
I'll just give it one more minute. That way, have some more friends join us today. Um, one of these days I, I will be, Jorge and I um, actually speak fluent Spanish. So one of these days I plan to do one in Spanish entirely. Um, I didn't, I didn't schedule this one for Spanish, so I, I don't want to use switch languages. Um, but I, I will be hosting one later. Uh, we've been a little busy with Fusion 360 Electronics and creating some, some tutorial content and things like that. So I haven't been able to, to work on it as of yet. So, but we're working on that. Okay. We'll get that up and running as soon as possible. Uh, la, the suggestion has come up a few a few times uh, from our friends in Latin America as well as our friends from um, from Spain as well. So there is there is a really good following. So I'll go ahead and try to to schedule one for that. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and stop my camera and move over to Fusion. I'm sorry to Autodesk Eagle. That way we could finish. Now we're gonna go ahead and complete that tutorial that we were hosting uh, on Tuesday, a couple weeks ago, uh, two days ago, that's what I want to say. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Okay, apparently, uh, let me go ahead and turn off my camera. I think that's kind of distracting having the camera turned on. So I'll turn off my camera. You don't need to be seeing me. I won't, I won't be moving in from here. So, um, and you just be patient with me. I'll do my best to manage the chat at the same time. So um, let me, uh, Jorge is asking me, let me go ahead and share this link. Okay, very well. You know, my name is Edwin Robledo. For those of you that have not been with us in the past, I'm part of the Fusion 360 support team and tech marketing. I also work, um, before here, I was working uh, primarily with, with Eagle. I was primarily what we're doing. So I did participate in the support, creating content as well, hosting webinars, tutorials, and, and creating some uh, educational material and doing some live presentations at universities. Uh, with us today on the chat, it's poss quite possible that Jorge will be joining us shortly. Um, but in the meantime, you know, on Tuesday, we were working on a schematic and we learned quite a bit how to work on a schematic. Everybody here should have been able to follow the steps that we did on that previous video on Tuesday of how we actually placed components on the schematic, as well as um, defining our connections. Um, we went through a couple of exercises, how to do pin breakouts as well, um, which is kind of a shortcut for you to actually just break out a component. And even though the example I used was a small component, just yes, because of time constraints, but you could, it's a common practice to be used on very large components. So if you have a BGA with a couple of thousand pins, I'm being able to use the breakout is actually a big relief. So um, let's try to do it. For those that the, the room is getting kind of packed, so yes, you know, those that are joining us through Zoom or through uh, Fusion 360, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Now, let's go ahead and start working. As you have, as you can see already, I have my schematic open up editor uh, available, and we have our little design. And with, um, with Eagle, it's really easy to create your circuit board based on this, on this design, on the schematic. So... Let's go ahead and click on this icon here that says schematic to PCB, as you see right here. 
even though I have two sheets, as you can see here, I, I didn't really populate anything on the other sheet. That was just an example. So let me just get rid of that sheet. Uh, remove that sheet. That's only one schematic sheet. So we're back to one sheet. Um, let me see what I've done so far and create this onto the circuit board. Okay. Once you click on go to circuit board, you're going to be prompted create from schematic. And you're going to be prompted if you want to create a circuit board based on the schematic. I'll go ahead and and click on yes. I did get a question about um, subscriptions for Fusion uh, for Autodesk Eagle. Just remember that to get a commercial license of Eagle, it's actually free with, with the subscription of any Fusion 360. So if you've subscribed to Fusion 360, you, you get for free Eagle, okay? Just to let you know. Now, when I click on, um, you know, let me just change my background a little bit here. That way it makes sense. My layout, I'm gonna use a black background, the tech board size. Okay. So what you're gonna see is that all the components, when I switch from schematic over to board, all the components appear on the left-hand side of an empty board. This is kind of a default board size that it matches approximately four by six inches, which is well, half a Euro card. And this just comes from our legacy versions. Um, and also since I'm using the premium version, it kind of like goes to that size. If I had a free license of Eagle, if I was using a free license of Eagle, and then it would go to approximately three inches by three inches, which is the board size limitation if you're, if you're currently using the, the free version of Eagle, okay? Now, um, now, this board outline is kind of large. Okay, so I'm um, the default command. Sorry, I was, I was reading the chat to see if there's any questions just there. <laughs> I saw a lot of traffic, so I was just taking a quick look at it over there. So this is the default outline. Notice that there is a difference in the background. Just letting you know that this is the PCB um, background and this is the outside boundary of the, of the circuit board. Down on the bottom left corner right here, you see that little X. Let me zoom in on this a little bit. That's the origin of the page. We'd like to strongly recommend that you always work on the positive quadrant, as you could see here. Reason behind that is just, is just if you need to type in coordinates for any for the placement of a, comp of a component or you are searching for a component at certain X and Y coordinates, it's a lot easier if you're working primarily with positive coordinates. Also, when you generate your manufacturing files, which the common format is called Gerber files, and for drills, it's going to be your Exxon files, uh, board houses don't like to deal with negative numbers, okay? And, and Eagle is actually, if you have that option selected, it's actually going to push them out in actual coordinates. Now, there is an option to force to force real coordinates. The downside to that is, is that the readings on the Gerber files for the X and Y coordinates don't really match those that are actually on the circuit board in Eagle. Okay, so that's why we prefer that you just work on the positive quadrant. Um, the, the capabilities on the circuit board are really big. It's, it's very rare that you actually hit anything unless you're doing some sort of a whole back plane or something like that, okay? Something very, very large. Okay, so now, just like we did on the schematic editor, you're gonna notice that we have icons on the top here. Hey, we Ed. have our pulled out menus on the top. Oh, hi, Jorge, how are you? Good, and you? How's everything? Doing phenomenal. Thank you for joining us, man. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Excellent. I'll take care of the of the of the YouTube chat. Keep doing what you're doing. I just oh, I'm sorry I had to come in late. That's okay, no problem. Well, just to let everybody know, Jorge Garcia is part of our uh, kind of a support and content team and creating data sets. Uh, Jorge and I have been working for approximately 11 years or so. So if you participate on any of the Eagle or Forum for Fusion 360 Electronics, you'll see his participation there. So. A uh, person with a lot of experience. And yesterday we did one for Fusion Electronics. So we've had a bit of a busy week this week, uh, hoping that the time people that have some time off right now uh, can learn some new skill sets, uh, designing some basic electronics. So as I was saying, 
So we have our pull down menus, we have our icon, we have our command line. Uh, those of you that have actually been using Eagle for a while, we actually use the command line quite a bit. Any command that you need that required can be basically typed, okay? So if you need to draw a line, just type the command line and you'll see that the action toolbar right here changes, okay? So every time you execute a command, you'll get all the options for that command right here on this toolbar right here. Okay, this parameter toolbar that we have. So if I disable any the command by hitting the stop sign, you'll notice it goes away. So I have no command currently active. Okay. The tool, the tools on the left hand side, the toolbar on the left hand side has been organized um, the for similar uh, properties. So we have info as well as just to highlight something, a show. So if I want to highlight like this line, I use highlighting that line. Uh, info, oh actually no click on it and it'll bring up the properties of that component. That's mainly the, the difference between that. When there's no command active, the group command automatically gets activated. So if I wanted to create a, um, a group to move a, the selection, I, I have no command active as you can see. I'll left click and hold and you notice that a group actually gets selected, okay? I don't wanna use this group, so I'm gonna hit the escape key to get rid of that group, of that group selection. Okay, of the of selecting. Now, if I want to move a component, I'll just click, do a left click and hold on the center of that component, on the origin of that component, which is that handle. The majority of components that we create are always going to have the handle in the dead center. But I have seen users actually create components that have their handle maybe on pad number one, like on an IC. So you'll notice that crosshair, that's the handle, will appear here. Now for this to appear, for this handle to appear, you gotta make sure that you click on the display command, which is right here, the layer settings. And these two layers need to be turned on. It's called the T origin, as well as the B origin. The B origin only is for components that are on the bottom. So you have to have that layer turned on and this one as well. I'll go ahead and turn it off, that way you can see what happens. You notice that the handles actually disappear. Therefore, I, I won't be able to select these components. Uh, I'll click all day long and I won't be able to select them. So that, that layer has to be enabled. By default, we actually enable that layer by default, okay? So you don't really have to worry about that unless you're gonna start working with somebody's other design and they may have it disabled, okay? So with the group command active, which is already, I could click and hold, left click and hold and select the component directly as you can see here. Very well. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to modify this board outline. This board outline is just way too big. So I'm just going to modify this board outline. So I'm going to left click and hold on the outline and I'll drag it in a little bit. Kind of sort of like this. And I'll click on hold on the top segment and bring this in as well. You notice that it's constantly changing. The background colors change. Just letting you know, identifying what's actually um, the space that's going to be used for the circuit board directly. Okay, I'll click on Zoom to Fit, which is this icon right here we have there. Zoom to Fit. Now I'm going to start placing some parts on my board. First thing I'm going to do is bring in my connector where I plan to bring in my my power. Now, I click and hold. I click and hold. Selects the component. Now I could right click to rotate it of increments of 90 degrees. Okay. If I need to use a different angle, I'll just go ahead and you'll notice that on the action toolbar, let me just do this, it's better. You'll notice over here on the action toolbar, these have changed, as you could see here. Okay, I can mirror it. Okay. It's got many options here. I can mirror it, that way I can put it on different, I, I could, um, swap it and mirror it as well. And I could change the angle here. I can manually type in a value that I would like to use. So let's say, for example, I want it to be at 45 degrees, for example. So once I go back in, you'll see that it's at 45 degrees, okay? So you could actually change that. Let me undo this, okay? Let's put this over here on the edge of the board. Now notice that as soon as I got too close to the edge of the board, I got these hatch marks here. That's just indicating that I have what's called a DRC violation. 
section. Just letting me know that I got too close according to the parameters that I have set the criteria that I have set up for this board for to make it manufacturable. I wanted to do this that way it makes my way into DRC. So when before you actually work with any board or start populating the components on a new board, we strongly recommend that you go over to the design rule checker. Okay, so let's go to DRC. I'll go ahead and type it. You could type DRC if you want to, but then again, the commands are down here available as well. So you can type DRC. Many board houses provide a DRC file, which is compatible with Fusion Sync as well as with Eagle. If you visit um, like um, outfits um, in Europe or here in the US, several of them, you visit their website, they will have the DRU file. That way you could go ahead and load it. That way you following their criteria. That way you have, you're able to spin your board a lot faster, get your boards back faster if you follow their criteria. okay? To do that is if you were to download it, you would go to the DRC as I showed you and you would click on load here and you would actually navigate to where that file is located, okay? Now we have some example files already um, that have been contributed to us. Like the other day, I was just taking a look at the one. I downloaded the DRU file from Volterra, you know, that inkjet printer, that conductive inkjet printer. So I wanted to take a look at their settings as well. Now, if you go to the folder um, where you have Eagle installed, if you're a, a Mac user, it's going to be under your applications. If you're a PC user, it'll be in your C root. So go here to examples. Go here to design rules, examples. And here we have from WeDirect. These are different outfits in the, in the, in Europe. We have multi-PCB, uh, multi and they have actually provided many of them as well. So depending on what criteria you're going to be following, if it's two-layer, four-layer boards, they have a several of them that are available. So we have, we've actually added many of them already by default, and you could access them this way, or you could download them from their website. Once you select it, just click OK or open, and those parameters will actually be selected. Here where it says layers is where you're going to define your layer stack up. This is only a very simple design, so it's only a two-layer board. So I'm not going to get too crazy here. Now, um, layers always work on pairs, okay? So even if you have a three-layer board, it's always going to work as four layers no matter what. So we set this up to always do a layer pairs. So if by any chance this was going to be a four-layer board, I would click on this down arrow here and click on layers. Select four layers. As you can see, now I have the exterior layers, which is 1 and 16, and our interior layers layers which is two and 15 and two as well as you can see here okay now the via setup that i currently have is going from the top layer to the bottom layer as you know vias are points of transition in which a trace is going to navigate from one layer to another layer in this instance i'm only using straight through hole of vias if you needed to do a setup for blind and buried which a really increase in exponentially increases the, the cost of making your boards. But if you do need the space, and then here you could go ahead and set up if you want to use blind or buried vias as well. That's where you set this up, okay? Clearances, these are the different clearances that you're going to define for the board. How close you're going to allow it to be between traces, between pads, between vias, between other pads as well, and so forth. And distance is the amount, the distance that is, uh, it's controlling. If it's going to flag anything that goes from the board edge, which is the dimension layer, to anything that has to do with copper. And that's why you're seeing this error here. That's why I wanted to bring that up, because that's what you're getting here. I've violated that 40 mil distance. Therefore, that's why I'm getting those hatch marks there. Okay. And the size of the drill hole. Okay, so the minimum drill hole size is actually six mil. So if there's any drill hole size on your circuit board, which is below six mil, it's just gonna let you know. And it's, I don't know if any board houses actually support something smaller. I, I'm pretty sure they do. I, I'm fairly sure they do, um, but that will actually increase the cost. Okay, and then um, this is the minimum width that I'm gonna be using for my traces when I'm doing some routing, um, the drill hole size. And if you're going to be using micro uh, micro vias, this is where you'd set this up. Micro vias are primarily used for large BGA setups. Everything else is kind of straightforward. You don't really need to be concerned. Our our values are fairly conservative. 
therefore um, using our DRC settings um, will it, it actually can make the board. Um, it, it is quite manufactured if you use our default settings, is what I'm trying to say. Now, um, the movement of my of the components that I'm doing here is based on my grid. So you notice that they're snapping. It's a kind of a, a coarse grid. So they're actually snapping pretty big. I don't have no middle points. So I'm going to actually change my grid to smaller grid. I don't know why I did 10 millimeters. You know, I think I was using 10 millimeters because today I was using the caliper and I was measuring something at 10, uh, 10 millimeters. Okay, very well. Okay. So you continue uh, selecting other components. Now this connector, I actually wanted to feed, but I wanted to, f it's gonna be connecting um, to the design through the bottom. So I actually need to um, switch this over to the bottom layer. I'll go ahead and right click it and select mirror. Now it's on the bottom layer. I just got to rotate it now. You notice that the pads go blue. It's just in it letting you know that it's on the bottom layer. Pads that are red is just letting you know that it's on the top layer. Let me just go ahead and I'll grab my LEDs. Okay, it's a quick layout. I just wanted to put the, something together really quickly. As you can see, I move all my parts over. And these lines that you see, these yellow lines are connections that are coming over from the schematic. So all these connections that I actually defined from the board on the schematic, all these connections, including the power connections are actually being transferred. And that's what they, and this is referred to as a rat's nest, okay? Now I'll do a zoom to fit, okay? Notice that I'm having a hard time selecting this component because there's two um, there's two signals going through it. So the entirety of this is called rat's nest. All these connections and the conglomerate, the way you see it here, is called a refer to as uh, a rat's nest. Each individual connection we refer to it as a signal. Okay. Now I'm trying to select this component. I'm uh, having a little bit of a hard time because I have those those lines around it, and it's kind of selecting the part as well. So if I wanted to use the selection filter, I could go here and say, you know what? I want to filter only when I do a mouse click. I will only want you to be able to select components. Therefore, now if I click here, it will no longer be confused. It's only selecting components. No matter what's going on, it will only. I cannot select anything else, though. I, I could try selecting anything else, but I won't be able to. Let's say I, I try the garage. Everything is hidden. Everything else kind of hides away. If I try to move this component, I, it allows me to but I cannot grab the attributes because I've only selected device. Let me go ahead and reset this. As you can see, now the handles appear of every asset. The handles now show up again. Okay, very well. 
Now with this uh, actually uh, component placement done, I'm gonna hide the the value layer because these values, some of these components have these, these large references that I don't need. So I'm just gonna go ahead and hide that layer. I think I can do a better job with these guys here. If I put them this way. Okay, now I wanna optimize all these connections that we have since we've been rotating the parts and moving them around and things like that. We wanna optimize and make this as short as possible. And the way you do that is by using something called a rat's nest command. I'll click here where it says rat's nest. And you'll see that it kind of optimizes connections. Let's see if it actually is true. This is a very small design. So as you can see, oh, a few of them did move. That way they found a smaller track, smaller way they're getting to the, each component, okay? So let's go ahead and start doing some, some routing unless there's any questions, Jorge. I'm gonna go ahead and start doing some routing at this moment. Or if anybody has any suggestions of uh, if I should move anything else, just let me know. So far, so good, Ed. Excellent, man, thanks. I use a mirror. I wanted to use the align tool because I want to space them out. Oops. There he goes. That was a. I just wanted. A, I just wanted the space between them to be exactly the same. So I group. I grouped it. I select the align tool that we have, and I select the option distribute vertically. As you can see here, I just wanted to kind of have them space exactly the same way as what I was trying to do there, which was accomplished. Now let's let's work with a few of the route tools that we have. We have many of them. So for, first of all, I'm just going to use the the regular manual route too. So that's this tool right here, right here. I'm going to select and route, and I'll just route from here. I'll zoom in on it. Now the remember the trace width for this line is based on what I set up on DRC. Okay, that's my trace width. Okay. In DRC, I said at least I need at least to have a minimum of six mil. So it's actually going to that value. If I need to change layers for any reason, I'll do that example. Now I'll go ahead and start uh, continue doing the route. And when I reach my selection, my destination, I should, sorry, you notice that we get this yellow X there that shows up. It's just letting me know that I have actually accessed my destination. I am where I need to finish my, my route. So now I'll left click and it will actually boink at me here to my end. Um, and it will release it from my mouse cursor. Just letting me know that I've completed the route. I'll do one more that way you could see it. Okay. Now let's see what happens over here with our, with our connector. You'll notice that I have components on the top layer and I have components on the bottom layer, as you can see here. So at, at any given point, there has to be a point of transition here. Something has to go from one layer to the other layer. So let me go ahead and begin on, on this layer. The active layer is always displayed here on the here on top. So right here on this dialog, but let me just bring a big arrow here that everybody could see it. That's my active layer right there. So let's go ahead. I do have the route command still active. And I'll start routing from this top. But I won't, you'll notice that it, I don't give that confirmation here to go to any other layer. I can't click there because it's not snapping to it because that's actually on the bottom layer. So there has to be a point of transition between this point and another one. And to do that, I'm going to use, I could use a center mouse button, of course, that will give me um, the via. And now I could place the via wherever it's necessary. Okay. But I'm going to, I'm going to just, Use this. You could also use the space bar, which I actually prefer using the space bar as well. So I will just hit the space bar once. You notice that the depth of this via is going from the top layer to layer 16. If I had a multi um, layer setup with blind or buried vias, every time I hit the space bar, it will give me different depths. So I would go from layer one to layer two, for example, layer one to layer 15. 
or you know i could hit, keep on hitting the space bar that way i could get the different via yeah, depths that apply with the current trace that i'm working on now at the bottom of the of of this of this editor in the editor workspace that we are let me bring it, that up here look down here as soon as i start uh, drawing another line it's letting me know here on the status bar that my next layer is actually going to be the bottom layer. So as soon as I do a left click to place that via, it will start routing on the bottom layer. And you'll see that down here as well. Okay. So I'll go ahead and left click. <clears throat> and now I'm routing on the bottom. Now I get the confirmation and that's where I want to click. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is one way of doing some routing. We have, um, some other really neat tools that I would like to go ahead and demonstrate. <clears throat> okay, so um, we also could do, let's say here, you're gonna notice right here, if I go click on that little sliver, can you see that little sliver there? I could either right click or I could click on the sliver. It, it's the same thing. I could either, so I, I'm clicking, you know, left click on the sliver. And we have something here, what says quick route, quick route or air wire. So if I select this option, I could go to, let's say we have some straightforward connections here. This, these are really straightforward connections. So I don't really need to spend the time that much for routing. it. I click there and you notice that it draws a path and it actually does a very good job I draw in a really nice path for me. And I could just, let's see if this will work as well. You can see it did a nice path there as well. But another uh, another tool that we have for quick route, I really like to highlight this one as well. I'm gonna return to the manual route option. Let's go ahead and route this guy here. Okay, so this is my v, one of my V plus lines, and I just wanted to do a little crazy of a route. And I wanted to exaggerate just because I want you to be able to see what's going to happen now. So under the quick route options, we have something called quick route smooth signal right here, smooth selected signal. So this will actually uh, route uh, or optimize the current route path that I've selected. So let me select that one. And I'll click on the line right here. And you notice that it optimize it. You know, Jorge, I've actually used this in conjunction with the auto router. There's been times that the auto router, I'll let the auto router rip on my board. And then I'll go back and start using this, the smooth router just to be able to, to, to kind of clean up those paths that the auto router decided to take. So it's very common that you may use the auto router and then come back with this as well. Okay. So that, there you go. That's, you know, there's a, that's a really nice option for you. Yeah. Available. That's a good use case for it. Okay. Um, also, you know, we, we do have, and it doesn't really apply here, but we could actually do multiple lines. Um, it, I don't have a use for it here, but I just want to show you how it works. So I could select um, a quick route on um, multiple air wires, as you can see here. And I could go ahead and let's say, and select these two lines and if I left, uh, you saw that line that selected them, then I could do a left click and it, it routed them. You see it routed this one there, routed that one there. So I could actually um, use it for multiple lines if I wanted to. As you can see, it went through there as well. So go ahead and, and explore. There's many more here available as well. <clears throat> and I just want to go over one more on the route. A couple options that you have on the route. Please notice that I'm, I'm, I have the option walk, walk around obstacles enabled. So if I start routing here and I, 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 re, I reach this point, it won't let me get through it. It doesn't let me, I could, I could push all day long. It won't, I need to go around it. As you can see, it's hugging that pad. It's doing that on its own. I'm not even trying to do that. It's just letting me know that if I go there, there's a violation and it will not let me go. Now, if I have one, if I want full manual control, like our legacy users used to be able to, I'll click on ignore obstacles 
And now that lets me go through anything I want to go to, as you could see. It's not avoiding anything. And you get the hatch marks where there's a violation. Another option that we have is called push and shove. Here we go. So as you could see, it actually pushes the line. As you can see right there, it's actually pushing. Push and shove is actually very, very useful as well. I like using push and shove, especially in the use case scenario that I use it the most is that let's say I have a whole bunch of bus lines or I have a, a um, kind of a large amount of lines that have already been manually routed. And now I need to increase the wire width. I would actually need to be able to kind of either space them evenly or I would actually need to be able to um, rip them up and reroute it at the new wire width. Let's say the, the load of one of those traces requires a, a larger wire width, for example. Uh, therefore, I would have to start ripping everything up or start moving, kind of like juggling around, moving other traces out of the way. That way I could beef up a particular wire width. With push and shove, that's not necessary because you could just beef up the line and then you start routing. And if it's possible, if there's space, if there's no DRC violations, it will let you it will let you plow a path and it will move everything. It will move the other traces out of the way. So I just wanted to bring that up because I actually find it as a very useful tool. Now, last but not least, we have something called the auto router. I'll bring that up now as well. The auto router is... It shouldn't be your first tool to go to. We strongly recommend that you do your manual routing. Go ahead and practice your manual routing. Aesthetically, you'll get a much nicer looking board, even though this is a small design. So let me bring up the auto router. And as a comment, I should let you know that anything that you have manually routed will not be touched by the auto router. The auto router will absolutely ignore anything that's already been routed, which is kind of kind of a neat tool, kind of a neat feature. Um, here's your layers preferences, as you can see here. I'm only using a two layer stack up setup. So it's only have the top and the bottom layer set up. I could set up my effort. It's just how much effort it's going to do, uh, how much more effort it's going to do to route my board 100%. Basically what it does is that it puts more instances of the auto router in multiple threads. So I get the results in parallel. Um, here I could set up a grid if I deselect this option and I'm just going to let, you know what, I'm just going to let it set its own grid on its own. It will figure it out a grid that it will like to use. And if I want to use a topological router, which is kind of a, a algorithm within our, it's a separate algorithm within our auto router, which takes into consideration the geometry of the board in a, in a sense to make it a single routed, a single layer routed board. Okay. And that's what the topological router will do. Many times a topological router will actually take a little longer than the other ones, and I'll show you how that works now. So if I click here on continue, okay, it's, it figured out that it could do a total of 10 threads. It'll give me 10 different results. The topological router usually shows up here on the top as well. And I'll go ahead and click on start. It's routing the board. Actually, I already completed. It's letting me know how many vias I had to use for each route consideration. As you can see, the different paths it took as well. Okay, and the topological router is the one that usually will have the least amount of vias. And you'll notice that none of the traces that I already routed are totally being ignored. It didn't touch anything that I had already done as well. As you can see, all these lines I had done manually. Once I, I find a, a path or a, a study or, or a routing uh, path that, that I like, or it's convenient for my design, I'll just go ahead and highlight it and select the option end job here. Okay, remember the manual route with obstacle avoidance as well as the auto router is respecting all of your DRC settings as well as your layer settings. Everything from there is actually being respected to be able to do this. Therefore, being able to get a manufactured board should be possible. I'm going to select the fly menu here where it says manufacturing. Just to take a look at, take a preview of what this board looks like if I was actually going to have it made. So I'll click here where it says manufacturing. And here's what kind of sort of my board looks like if I was to get it back in the mail, as you could see there. I'll flip it over to the other side. That way we could go ahead and see our, D, our, our connector that we use. There's the connector on the other side there. And there's on the top side as well. Last but not least, 
I want to fill a polygon for this. I want to create a polygon for the entire board. Since I just want to use the entire board, I'm going to take advantage, since I already have a board outline, I'm going to take advantage and draw my polygon there. So what I'm going to do is on the board outline, I'm going to do a right click that you see here. And there's this option to convert this to a polygon. I don't want to replace it. I just want to duplicate it. I want to copy it onto another layer. I'll select the top layer here. It's going to make a copy of that whole outline and I'll click OK. And I'm going to go ahead and return. I'm going to right click the polygon. Let me see. I make sure I grab it. And I'm going to select the name option from the context menu because I actually want to name this polygon. I want to give it the name Brown. So I'll use select GND here. Okay. Now to force the polygon to pour, if I actually want to see the pour happening here, I'm going to go ahead and click here where it says rat's nest. And there you got it, it poured. It's poured all on my on the top side. So that's why it's red because on the top, I could do the same thing on the bottom. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at some connections here. Now, the thermal connections, these, these little lines that you see here, are thermal connections connecting the polygon to this same ground. Remember that I named my polygon ground, but these lines here are very, very thin, okay? And the reason that we have thermal connections is that because if the polygon would swallow the entirety of the pad, it would actually be very difficult to, to solder to it because heat would dissipate. And if you're using a reflow oven, you would see your schematic just kind of like just navigate into another zip code. So um, uh, that's why we always, by default, always have uh, thermal connections. But this value is way too small. So we need to change that value because that thermal connection actually is totally not really not real, not real. So let's go to the properties of the polygon. You notice that if for some reason, I don't know why, but it set a width to zero. That's not really a good value that we use. So let's go to the grid. the properties set this to a much higher value i think i went too high this time but i just wanted to use a really big value and that way you could see how what's the influence when it comes to when you change a wire width of a polygon so now my thermal connections are strong ones okay that's why i kind of wanted to use a very very large value now I have orphans disabled. Therefore, when there's a separation between the polygon, anything that separates, that breaks out of the polygon, and it's going to be an orphan. In other words, it doesn't have a path or connectivity to the primary polygon, and then it's going to leave it blank. And that's why you see these blank areas here, because if it poured polygon here, it had it was totally isolated from the rest of the polygon. Therefore, it just left it blank. Okay. Let's take a look at if I change those properties, how does it look? So I'm going to go to the properties and I'm going to let it have orphans. So I'm going to select here this orphan option here. And you notice that now it pours for the entire board. Okay. But this segment here is totally isolated from the primary. Okay. Kind of doesn't really defeat the purpose of it, but it sort of does because um, this is connecting to, to the poor ground these are not connected there. So it's different, the connection here from this one, even though there's nothing here in this area that is connecting the ground. That's why it was an actual orphan. So I'm gonna leave that set up there as well. Okay, very well. Okay, we primarily kind of pretty much done with the board. I'm just gonna go re review really quick uh, the different options that you have to create what's called the circuit board files or the manufacturing files or the Gerber files. Before I do that, let's go ahead and run DRC, design rule checks. You know what? I'm going to have it go take a look at my board, see if, if I have any like really bad violations. I'm going to tell it to check. Um, and look at that, Jorge. I got no errors. So nothing came up. If you take a Ooh, look at the status bar victory. here the bottom, <laughs> if you can see right here in the bottom, I got zero errors, so I'm I'm happy. I'm a happy camper right now. It's pretty good. Okay, got no errors. That's a small board, so it would be uh, it would be kind of weird if I did have errors. <laughs> Such a small design, this example design, but I have no errors. So that's the first thing you want to do. Now let's go ahead and take a look at creating manufacturer files, and we have a couple options here. 
we have a one click option, which is this one right here. See where it says generate cam data right there. Let me see if everybody, I want to get everybody's attention to the same line here. Where it says cam data right there. So let's go ahead and click on there. That's kind of a one click solution. I like to call it. It's like a one click solution. So it loaded a template based on my layer stack up on DRC, which is two layers. So it automatically loaded that template. And then it's going to generate all these files, as you can see here. So it's going to create the Gerber files for the top. The Gerber format that we're using is called 274X, even though we have support for X2. But 274X kind of seems to be the standard in the market, in the industry right now, uh, when it comes to creating your circuit boards. Remember, the Gerber files is actually layer combination. So you don't get one Gerber file. You get multiple Gerber files based on the layer combinations that you have. So therefore, I have my Gerber for... My Gerber job file, that's the job. The, the job that is being used to create these Gerber files is going to be stored. That's going to be called my job file. Then I have my top copper, my bottom copper. So the top copper is consists of the top layer combined with pads and vias. The bottom is the combined, the bottom layer combined with pads and vias. So let's see what that looks like. I'll use, use the display command. I'll tell it to hide all the layers. And so my top copper is going to be my top layer combined with my pads and my VS. Okay, so that's my top copper layer. This is what the board house is going to get. Okay, now for my bottom, I'll de deselect the top and I'll have the bottom layer. So this is what the CAM processor is doing. This is what it's going to be producing, as you can see. And it will continue going. So and then it will create another one only with my silk screen layers, which usually refers to the T place layer and the teening layers, as you can see. So it'll produce another Gerber file. And then what the board house does is that it kind of starts um, joining them all together, stacking them up and getting your final product. Of course, the first one being their copper sides first. Okay, and it ends up with the solder mask. Okay, so let me cancel out of this to go back to my normal, go back to the one click solution that we were analyzing. Um, and then it goes through solder paste, cream layers, silk screen. It creates your your Exxon output file, which is the file that's going to be used to poke the holes on your board, as well as your bomb and your pick and place machine and your pick and place files as well. They all get created and they're going to be zipped up as you can see here. So if I was to click, okay, it's going to prompt me which path I want to put it. So I actually want there where my project is. This is going to be the default path. So this is the, I have it under documents, Eagle projects, uh, flash new, which is this tutorial that we're doing today. And then that's the name of the file. And I'll click on save. Now there will be instances and it actually uh, opens up the, the finder. I did open it up. It's on my other screen. I did open up the finder with, um, with, the, with that path already highlighted. Now there'll be instances that you may want to do some, some modifications to the CAM processor output. Let's say, for example, you decided to put some documentation on the measurements layer or the reference layer that you actually want that to be part of the silk screen. It's quite possible you need that to be part of the silk screen. Therefore, um, you will need to include that in the CAM processor. To be able to do that, let's go ahead and go to the CAM processor. kind of funny my uh yeah uh, you know these are the what happens when you work from home <laughs> my my wife just walked in and brought me a juice <laughs> okay very well so let's go to the cam processor should have brought so one for me <laughs> yeah that's kind of cool <laughs> i guess she didn't realize i was i was going i was live here so she, she walked in with a juice it's pretty neat it's a green juice uh, uh i'm pretty sure they you they usually are excellent so Okay, so in the CAM processor, this is what it looks like. Of course, the same way we did it on the one click solution, it loads the template. It loads the appropriate template, as you can see here. We have our template for two layers, since I only have a two layer board. Um, and then it's subdivided in sections. So we have our Gerber files, we have our drill file, and then our assembly, which is going to be the pick and place and the bill of materials. Now, let's say, for example, on the silt screen layer, that's where I've seen this the most, is I could click on the silt screen layer. And that's what's going up. But if I made any other additional references on an additional layer, 
then I would just click here and actually highlight and select that layer. So let's say in addition to the T place and the T name layers, I want to select uh, the reference layer right here because I have some information that I want to include on that output as well. And then I would just go ahead and select that layer as well. Okay. I have the option of zipping them up as well as export to a project into the project directory, which I actually want that to go to the project directory. Uh, and I could zip them up. I don't want them zipped up at this time. Now I just go ahead and click on process job. It's actually created the job and I'll select uh, open the folder and I'll bring that over here. There's my cam outputs and there are the three folders that I created as you could see. These are my Gerber files are located there. Okay. My drill file, which is this one right here, is right there. And then my assembly, which are these two files, actually it's three files, uh, since I have components on both layers. So it's um, my pick and place for the top, my pick and place for the bottom, as well as my bill of materials files here. Okay. Now you can go ahead and upload this data into your manufacturer or prototype house. Um, website and usually within less than a week or around a week you'll get your boards back and you're ready to solder them well this covers all the material i wanted to cover today about creating and working on your circuit board on the board side okay are there any questions all right maybe that we could uh, help them out today so far i've caught up with everything on the chat so the chat looks good so you know now the end zoom Oh, okay. we're good. Um, no, I don't. I don't see anybody um, uh, on Zoom yes of yet. So I think we're we're good. Um, yes, go ahead, and I'll put in the the email address um, support.eagle at autodesk.com. Okay. Yes, in case you need some additional assistance with your design, remember that Fusion 360 Electronics um, is compatible with Eagle Files as well. You'll find a tutorial on the Fusion 360 website, a YouTube channel, in which I did a, a four minute tutorial of how you can load your Eagle Files into Fusion 360 Electronics. Greatly appreciate you joining us today. It's been a pleasure, it's been a lot of fun. I uh, hope to see you next time. We'll be here on next Tuesday, again, at 2 p.m. Eastern time, hosting some more webinars. Jorge, as always, thank you for attending to the chat and uh, bringing in your insight as well. Everybody, go ahead and please stay safe. Um, keep that into consideration. Be kind. And thanks again for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Jorge, thank you very much for everything. Everybody, have a great day. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Jorge.